All right. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to Terra Prime Live uh, special classes here. We've got uh, Damon coming back with us with some monkey sticks. So I'll turn it over to him. There we go. Oops. Wait. Oh, no. What have I done? I don't know. Can you guys see me? Yes, we can see you. We can. All there good? we go. All right. Awesome. Well, hey, everybody. Um, it's good to see everybody. And um, I just wanted to go over some basics of um, some staff technique that comes from my knowledge within the monkey system and also with the Peking Opera. Um, I want to start with some basics like grips, go into spins, of course, that people like, body postures, not just spins with the staff in itself, right, in front, but also spins that involve, involve using the body, things like that. Um, One-handed ones how to intercept it and put it like within, you know, your shoulder joint, how to get things so things don't become clunky and like looking at posture where I see a lot of people when they're doing staff stuff, they're like in like this rather than extending and keeping themselves flowing. And also just basic warm up exercises with the staff that look basic, but are actually quite difficult to do. And, um, and then also go off, go talk about footwork and, and staff materials. Cause people like, I want a first staff, what do I get? that kind of thing. Um, of course, in the, in the my monkey system, we use a metal staff. I have a titanium staff. I didn't bring that one out in the cold. Um, I'm gonna save that one for later. For some reason I'm afraid that it would get too cold and my hands would stick to it and freeze. That would be kind of fun. But let me go over different staff materials. This one is rattan. And the, and the great thing about rattan is it has a reverb. See, if I'm just, I'm just making a fist like this, I'm not doing anything really extravagant, but you can see how it has a little bit of a bounce, right? So that's kind of good if like you want something light and you want to feel like a, a whip in the technique. So when you do a, a strike, you feel like you have that. Or if you want something that kind of starts to, when you get cooking with a technique, kind of has a little bit of bend to it, right? And plus it's a little bit more yielding if you make a mistake and hit yourself. One I like to use a lot, and I'll go back and forth between all three of these during the classes. This is a um, waxwood, and most of the time they use it for spears, but this is an untapered waxwood staff, which is a little bit more difficult to find. I prefer this to oak. The oak staff to me is kind of like heavy and unyielding, and this has just a little bit of a give, and also it has like a nice smooth look. Traditionally, the monkey staff is a little short, like you go down and it's at the eyebrow, the head, the eyebrow, or the chin, or the nose, depending on where you want. And then finally, the most safe of all staves, which I use when I teach my kids, is the fun noodle racked in duct tape. The most deadly of all staves, right? It's like the bent pencil trick. This one is really, really good because it, you, can, you can give it to beginners and they can really just go they can just really start touring and oh, if that happens, no problem. Oh, if that happens, no problem, right? And then they become less and less intimidated of trying fancy things. Even though it's a little thicker, you can just get it. What I do is I tape it down so it becomes dense and not super flimsy. This one's been through a lot because I because I attack my kids with it so they block, you know, do blocks with it. And, um, but this is also, it's just really good. It's cheap, you know, it looks silly as heck, but it's, it's a really safe thing to do, especially when you're teaching kids or, um, you want to get used to just having having something in your hand like this and also it, it takes care of a lot of um insurance problems too like if you're showing up and doing a workshop and you start hand, handing kids these wooden sticks people can be like what the hell you start handing them fun noodles you know like this modern times right so i'm going to do my best to demonstrate all the techniques on all three of these different staves um so you can see um, the similarity and difference with it. In my, in, when it comes to me, it's I don't care what I have in my hand. The technique, hopefully, is going to inform how I work with it. You know, you know, very Jackie Chan, pick up a ladder and do whatever you can. Okay. So, all right, let's start with. Let's go to the rattan one. Okay, so now let's start. Do you have any questions about that so far? Yes, Jeff. Yeah, just a couple for my own edification. Uh, you, you talked about the materials for the staff, and you also mentioned earlier that a lot of this inf is informed by the opera kung fu. 
is that what's informing the, your material selection for your staffs, the visual presentation versus a combat? Or oh, or yeah, oh, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, I would still fight with the rattan one just because it really smacks someone really good and it's really nice and lightweight. If, if I really wanted to do damage, I would get my titanium one out and go to town, you know, you know, cause I could go through a car, car window with that. But sure. when it comes, you know, but I think, am I answering your question or no? Yeah, no, I, I was just going to add some clarification. Um, I get what you're saying about staff work, but as you know, there's a, you know, a relationship between staff and spear a lot of ways. Oh yeah. yeah. For spear or, you know, to my reckoning are going to be somewhat select, you know, different because of the different focus and context. And also you mentioned titanium is part of your tradition. And I'm just wondering, is that a thing that evolved over its time? Because obviously titanium is a, is a modern metallurgy. It's oh not- yeah. A lot of most people will use, um, they use a steel one or aluminum one, but since that's a modern metal and it's really strong, a student of mine made me one cause I taught him, he made, he made me a staff out of airplane titanium. And it has like these ends that kind of glow that he dipped in electricity to make it look like. Oh, it's a fantastic uh, material. I was just. But it goes back to the it goes back to the myth of the Monkey King and his magic staff. Gotcha. That holds a a Milky Way. You know, it's like no one can lift it, no one can move it. So it comes to that. Really, whatever kind of you know, in the opera, they would just like kind of wrap it with like. Sometimes they'd have a rattan staff like this or a smooth rattan, and then for show they would wrap it with a metallic kind of fabric. That, that's just cool. To, I mean, uh, that's almost like a proto staff saber anyways in that kind of totally. Yeah. Yeah. And also the do as you will cudgel, which is what the monkey Kings think. I mean, he holds it behind his head like a cigarette and then he like pulls it out and then works <laughs> yeah, with it. You know what I mean? And so, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, there's a, there's a, there's ritual and performance with it and, and combat applications. But if I had to like, if I was going to grab, let someone breaks into my house and I grab a staff, I would probably grab the rattan one because it's versatile. It can block a lot. It can yield a lot. And it's fast enough where I can still cause damage quickly. Yeah, it definitely meant, you know, for a modern context. You you mentioned um, the Milky Way in the Monkey King, and I'm automatically drawn to the Pole Star and to ancient Taoist sorcery. Is there a strong context there as well? Um, Well, I can can jump in with uh, the – in the book – the oh yeah, in Journey to the West, it's full of it. Yeah, the stick is not actually a stick. It's called the needle that holds the oceans down. Yeah, and it's he an stole axle it. That everything revolves around, and he just pulls it out, and he's like, oh, "I'll take this." in other words, it's it's another version of the Axis Monday, the World totally. Tree. Yeah, yeah. So he basically steals it from the Dragon King of the, the East Ocean or something like that, and he basically just pulls it out, and that's why the oceans are all so crazy and all that. And then, so. Yeah, and, and he it slays can, it, everybody with it, and nobody can pick it up. He just kills everybody with it. Not yeah. kills, but he just like slays everybody with it. Anyways, let's get on to the physical technique before we get into too many diatribes about astral. Yeah, projection. sorry, I go off and change it sometimes. No, I, I like it, Jeff. I think it's good because I think what it does is it informs people that there's a, a bigger narrative behind the techniques rather than just like, oh, I'm looking cool twirling this around. There's yeah. a reason why we do it. Yeah. So, so please interrupt at any time with that. I appreciate it. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's look at some grips. Okay, so just hanging out kind of grip. I just keep it like this, right? Now, a lot of people are going to go like, right? Well, no, but you know, you want to be able to just stick to it easy, right? Something very easy. The opening of the form, right? Here, roll, pull. That's my opening, right? So when I think about my mid grip, I don't make it much wider than my hips. You know, maybe I don't really get out here because then I feel like I'm on a damn kayak and it feels just coarse, right? But nor do I keep it too narrow unless I'm doing a tight twirl because then you don't have any stability. So I try to think of dividing the staff into thirds. And when it comes to saber staff, that's kind of nice because the saber staff kind of has like a metal piece and the blades are kind of, so you can, you know, you can kind of float within that metal piece where the blades are projected out. Now I kind of think of it, you know, here, 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 that kind of thing but also over under, which makes a lot of sense for anything basic, right? And the same thing when you're gonna twirl, you can see how it's not tight like this. See, if I do it, I'm gonna show you good and bad and in between. See, I can twirl it tight and it's okay. If I twirl it wide, it looks coarse and weird, except if I go over to the Northern twirl, which comes over the top, which they do in spear a lot. 
which is a good transition. And I'll get to that later. But if I look here, I kind of have like maybe one and a half, two fist lengths in between, right? And I use my thumbs. And my opera teacher taught me this trick. Use the, use, you see, you want to be able to at any time grab it and go to one hand. So that's a really interesting thing. And that thumb becomes a pivot, not coming in here looking like a Tyrannosaurus Rex. But here, it's like I project forward almost to the tip of the staff with the basic twirl here, just so I can go into another transition. So the main thing, so that's this grip and this grip. And I practice just like doing pull-ups, right? If you're gonna do pull-ups this way or pull-ups this way or pull-ups this way, like exercise, right? And so I just keep it normal. How I get my wrists flexible with, with um, things is I work one-handed and I keep my hands. So again, not a hammer grip, not exactly like a sword grip, but something that floats in between. So if I'm here, how I like to warm up my hand, let me see if I can get you on here, is I like to go here and see how I can float the stick, almost like doing those um, Taoist like spheres. Do you know what I'm saying? Like a similar kind of floating feeling. And what that does is it gets me used to the staff on all parts of my hand, rather than just being here coarsely trying to manipulate the staff with, with see if I make a closed fist and I do a one-handed twirl, okay, that looks okay. But as soon as I open it up, and I let it float, you can see a slight difference between this, we'll go slow, and this. Same thing with both hands. If I'm, if I'm, if I'm coarse, I can't, for one, I can't even rotate the other way. Then it becomes, it looks like this. And you see people do a lot of this twirling a lot, where you go full on one side, half one to the other. But as soon as you start floating, then you cover the whole thing. And how that looks like the difference between the front, you see the front, this is the coarse way, see? It's like this side looks pretty good, but this side's like, Arr! Right, so, but then here, see how it goes back and forth from one side to one side. Then it covers the two spheres there. And it also gets you ready to do the clock twirl on this way or gets you ready to do the clock twirl on this way. So basically, even though you're twirling something in a circle, you're kind of making a perimeter of a rectangle around you with the staff when it's twirling. And that's one thing I wish they really would explore with um, lightsaber staff choreography is blocking blaster bolts like that, like around the back. It, it, there's just a lot they can do that they haven't, but that's my personal opinion. Anyway, so any questions about that? Uh, I, I have a, a couple. Sure. Um, it looked like your first orientation, it was, you're making a clear connection between with the weapon and your skeletal structure. So yep. that skeletal structure is reinforcing the weapon. That's correct. And, um, but you also show the difference and I'm taking this to be the difference between, you know, again, the wushu, the opera kung fu versus combatant kung fu, which isn't concerned as much about visual presentation. It seemed like when you stayed coarse or gross motor, it didn't look as cool, but you had, you know, that strong skeletal linkage between you and the weapon system almost at all times versus when you brought your hands together some. Uh, it certainly looked cooler and, and was faster by far but it, it didn't seem like you had the same skeletal connection to the weapon. Is that the difference between, you know, what's for the battlefield versus what's for the opera? Uh, or, is that, or is that a contrived association? Well, I would never wield my weapon coarsely with an, an undue amount of strength. And so if I keep, even though it might seem to you that I do like that, I actually don't. I have way more control and power with my light movements than I do with my grip. And, um, and also it's like, I mean, unless I'm coming like toe to toe with somebody with another weapon, but I'm not gonna do any of those types of movements in that. You know what I mean? I train these dexterities so I can do really simple movements easy. You know, it's like I train my horse stance so I can kick you harder. Sure. So it's like the same thing, you know what I mean? And so it's, it's not necessarily a contrivance or one or the other, they both inform each other, but they inform each other in the sense, are you practicing your strength techniques or your dexterity techniques? Sure, sure. That's yeah, how I think that, about that, it. That, make, that makes perfect sense. Also, like you're alluding to the over imprinting, right? So if yeah. I'm going over with this wide, deep horse stance, that I'm obviously not going to fight from, it's giving me the core strength and endurance necessary to fight when I'm back in the fight box. Yeah, exactly. Makes... And it also gives me the willpower to overcome different challenges and frustrations, you know? Yeah. And, um, and also the training the dexterity of, of like, let's say like with one hand with this floating technique, it also makes you less reliant on um, 
one side or the other. Sure. Like, I mean, I'm not the best with my left hand, but I can do pretty good with it. I'm confident enough that if my right hand was incapacitated, I could go to town with my left. Yeah. And that's I, just, uh, you know it, what I mean? It, 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 and so that, that, it adds yeah, to sure. coherence. So that's why it's important to train both sides equally with that and why I have a hard time when you see people twirling and there's like this like one sided twirl, something happens to the other side, then you, you just are lost. I mean, you just are rather than having both sides going where it happens. Right. And so I feel like it's a equilateral triangle between strength, form, application or, you know, physical attribute, form, application. And it just kind of intensifies and expands one corner as I practice more and more and more and more and more. Gotcha. Yeah. Cool. Those are good questions and excellent questions that I think people will really bring up. So we looked at that spin. So look at, so look at how different it is. If I pick up the fun noodle and do those spins. Well, first of all, the fun noodle is super thick, right? It's like ridiculous, right? However, it's, it's this, it's, you can still do it, but if you notice, I use my body a little bit more because if I don't, I'm actually going to hit myself because it's such so thicker, right? There. Right, easy. So I like training with different types of materials because um, I like training with different types of materials because it doesn't have me become reliant on any one thing. If I'm at, I'm at work and the lights go out and people get crazy, I can pick up a broom and break it off and go to, you know what I mean? And it's important to train. And on a practical sense, that's why I do that. Um, it's just, plus I just get bored of the same staff. Okay, so back to the rattan. Okay, so we got, so now let's look at the clock twirl. Okay, so we looked at this forward twirl here, right? Let's break this down. Now, if I take the staff away, it's gonna look good. it's gonna be a very similar looking pattern to a lot of things we've seen in martial arts before. Right? If I put two sticks here, put two broadswords here, it's the same thing. Same pattern. I open with manas, I open with these palm strikes, like you know, see it's everywhere. This flower is everywhere. And so it's important that this flower comes from a circle and also retains a space because. If you go from staff with this to broadsword with this, you know, then it's going to become, you want to be able to do both. But the main thing is the space between the space, right? So if I'm moving, you can see that there's a space in between my hands. That space is occupied either by my staff or any other weapon. So see, I have a space in between it, right? If I let it go, you know, even when I, if I just let it go, it's still there. If that makes sense. So that's how I think about that twirl. Any questions about that? I should have brought out the broadswords. That's just, that's a great demonstration. Just to clarify what you're saying, you're creating a sphere. And I, again, I'm brought back to bioenergetics and that kind of training. You're creating a sphere with the weapon system. And so we haven't talked about footwork yet, but footwork would also address the, the weak side if you have a weak side. Oh but yeah, also, totally. Absolutely. Yeah. But also create a bigger sphere. You exactly. can extend that sphere to now you're using the whole body to create an even big sphere mm -hmm. and you're, cha you're, you're controlling the combat space that way. Exactly. And it becomes sphere upon sphere upon sphere upon big sphere. It just becomes concentric circles out. That's, that's an excellent comment and observation. That's exactly where it goes. You can expand that into the collective. Yeah. The oh, sense. then we can rule the world from beyond the grave. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> or right check on. into a cycle ward, whatever comes first. Right on. <laughs> No, this is good because I want people to get both the inter the intrinsic and extrinsic aspects of these things because it's very personal and very beautiful. So that's that spin. Let's look at the clock twirl, right? Which is coming. And so you see a lot of people do this kind of twirl where they're like going like this. They're kind of like grippy with it or it's hard for me to do it wrong. Let's see. They're like going oh, and they're trying to get faster and faster with it and they're suffering. But they're also missing like this motion, right? So again, it's a circle within a circle. If I take just the basic hand mechanics, here, over under, full rotation, full rotation. Now my hands don't really change positions, right? I don't change positions with my hands for the staff. The staff goes around where I control it. Now, as I get going, you notice I start to kind of what, lazily tie the coat with the staff. 
So there's a circle that this circle moves around. If you're static in one spot, you can get fast. However, again, it, it does, it's what Jeff was commenting on. It doesn't bring us to our footwork where we're going to next, if that makes sense. So always with clock twirl staff, you know, and my teacher would, Chi Jin Guo, he would have me do it like right in front of him. Like he would stand like, like right here and the staff would have to, to get it right. Thank God I, I only hit his leg once or twice. And then reversing, right? So this is so this is a little bit of my weak side, Jeff. Is like, you know, I practice it so much on the right. It's not that I think my left is bad, but you can notice it's a little bit glitchier than my right. It's not as smooth. It's subtle. Those who can see can see it. Because my right, you can see I, my shoulders instantly relax a lot more. You know, and it almost, you want to not throw it though. You don't want to be here and like throw it into it and throw it into it. You know what I'm saying? I, I keep a connection with the staff the whole time, right? This over under motion that happens allows me to come to like a low guard or a mid guard, right? Allows me also here to switch up back into this twirl. Allows me also to pull back and use the body to go up into an upward twirl, up into a high guard. So again, you were dealing with spheres this way and you're dealing with spheres this way. All accented by the footwork, all supported by it. Does that make sense? Cool. Was that clear, that demonstration of that or do you need to see more of that? Good? Yeah, no, it was it was uh, really good. I mean, uh, the thing immediately comes to mind is you referencing, you know, sort of my own context is that there's this, what you're, you know, exposing to us is a lot of the fine motor linkages between gross motor positions. I'm very used to motorcycle, baseball, bat, golf club, you right. know, trans, you know, sword between, you know, spear, halberd, staff. Uh, and, and I, and I'm looking at the grip flexions and I'm thinking those grip flexions, that's good training for rapier, even though you're mm -hmm. talking about the staff. The other thing that, and I'm sure it's going to come out with a footwork is you know there's th that principle that power is communicated in spirals yeah and so once you add the footwork i can see that spiral you know you know inverse exverse you know that you're able to communicate power to the the sweet spots on the staff nice nice this is great so let's go into the let's go into the footwork there's not really a lot of guards basically you hold the staff in front of you and hit something so it's like you know here like i go low if i if i let me scoot back a little bit here if I, I can go low here where I think about it being here. This is really good for me to train connection with this is I toss the staff into my center, right? So I toss the staff into my center and glide it across from hip to hip, right? Keeping in a, keeping in a stance here, there, and I can really work it. You can also do it up here on a guard and down. So you get the, and the purpose of these exercises, one, it's really good to be able to absorb the hit and that's very, um, Dadao looking, this, this move, right? But it also gets the student and the practitioner used to having an object close to their body rather than always being afraid of wielding it and keeping it out here. You get used to it around your head the whole time. So you're not, so it's like, it's like someone who does firearms training, they're not blinking, right? The same thing here, right? You don't want to be working your staff and do an upper twirl and be like, I can't see it. You know, you have to, you have to be, you have to be good with it, if that makes sense. So before we go on to, then I want to address this position and this position, which are super important. Now, this position here, right, outside of looking like the beginning of so many forms we see, is really important to keep linkage to the shoulder, right? So you don't want this to happen. You don't want to get spassed out here, right? What's great about that is with accenting footwork is you can see how it can draw into the leg and open up just with something very basic. Right now, the twirl that we looked at before this way, when we go into you see what a lot in spear is when we're here and it goes into this one. What's great about that one here is that if I go and I use it as a transition, then you have that sweeping leg motion to go to the other side. So it's great to do forward, and yes, you can reverse it here and go this way, which is awesome. However, I believe it's secret is when you step forward, again, coming to the footwork with this one here, then it allows you to reverse and open. And then you see a lot of people come down and then they do the big strike like that and all that. So this becomes a sweeping motion, if that makes sense. It's also important about this one is 
looking at it like this, when you see a lot of people do these flowers here, you don't see this big flower too often with the staff or one-handed with the staff. You don't see it too often, right? Here, this way up, pull, pull. Now what's really good about this with the footwork is here and then you can step with it again. Here, here pull back. Let me scoot back a little bit. This way. So even when I don't have footwork, in a sense, I have my body down here, see, and I push pull here, turn here, and then I can either step back, right? So this motion is bop, 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 tone, chaw, maybe, right? Or I can step forward here, right? Or I can just end it, or go back into the sweep and then the attack. Same difference as if you just have it in your open hand. So I had the one that I was before and that we had there, but as soon as I turn over, right, this is very much looks like, right, you can hug some dude. You know, here, threading through, you can start seeing how it comes into open hand techniques as well. And how you don't just keep bringing it shorter, 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 but there's always like an extension and a reach and a push pull. Does that help with understanding the footwork and that grip? Yeah, I was gonna, just an, a, a question to clarify and also, uh, if we could see your knees and ankles better, but. Oh yeah, sure, no problem. But the, the thing I was gonna, the utility I'm getting from the way you're using the, the weapon system is that it seems like you're able to both threaten or ward the combat space while changing body orientation without losing any momentum. So you're able to That's make, correct. Keep, the, keep the weapon in the box to protect you while you're changing body orientation. That's correct. That's pretty yeah. cool. And it's especially helpful in like, in areas where there's a lot of obstacles around. Like if you're like, 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 you know, when I was growing up, I didn't really have a school to train at. Like I, you know, I go train in Polly's garage, but it, but it was, that wasn't a place That's where I go. Where I, are in garages, man. Yeah. Right. Or when I was doing jujitsu at the Medford judo Academy, which burnt down in the Oregon fires, which is really sad. Um, but it's like, that was, you know, two, three times a week, but I didn't have a key to that place. So I was out in the woods. And so I'd be practicing these twirls and I hit a branch. Well, that sucks. So it's like, you know, when you change environments, you start learning how to, and what's really great about doing that is like, when you're moving, you know, this becomes, I can quarantine myself within the, with wherever I'm at. And it's also really good for fight choreography because you're used to the staff in your hand, wherever you're going, right? And you don't have to really worry about what's up. So let me do those things. Let me show the ankles and stuff a little bit better on what I just did. And then I want to go into more showmanship spins like behind the back and around the body and things like that and then we can do some more cuning i think roberto had something uh he won't oh, roberto, what's up? i was just making an observation that uh, that uh, floating technique and and uh, loosening the grip of the hands looks like it's a great way to uh kind of train your amb ambidextrous uh, type of wielding that there's you're minimizing the difference between your strong side stance and your weak side side stance and gaining a lot more balance in uh rather than me than than uh, holding a, a six foot staff right hand dominant all the time now you can twirl it around and, and change the sides and all of a sudden your left hand uh leading and it becomes almost just as natural as if you were right hand leading. And a lot yeah. of the skills that you're doing uh, uh, and a lot of the techniques that you're doing seem like they're, they're a great way to start training that uh, balance between, uh, between a majority single handed lightsaber weapon that's uh, kind of like a, like a Japanese, uh, Japanese sword. You'd be right handed only. There's no left, -hand, left handed samurai. But with the staff, there's a lot more uh, room to be able to uh, use that offside or that uh, or that uh, support side. What's really interesting is Paulie Zink is right-handed, but when you look at him cut loose with his staff, it's usually in his left. Now that's a subtle observation, but I noticed that training with him, he has drilled his left so hard that there is no difference between the two. And when it comes to this one, when it comes to this this one. Um, that comes from the opera of when, when you see them do like the performance twirls with the two stabs like this, 
So you have to use both like this. So my teacher would have me do these exercises all the time and get the circles concentric or get them working together. Do you know what I mean? Like this kind of thing, out, in, and then granted these stabs are two different weights. So it's a little awkward, but that's okay. And then, you know, here, you know, and then we would go like, boom, and then we do all this like performance stuff that came like that. And so that's where that came from. Much like when we would have spear, and we would be doing these exercises with the spear. It's like the same thing with the center here. It's like you get it. So it's part of, part of you there. So yes, Roberto, that is an excellent observation. And I encourage everybody to do those exercises with both hands, as well as make coffee with your left hand and brush your teeth with your left hand. All in horse stance, of course. Right. <laughs> All right, let me um, review that so you can see the ankles a little bit on the thing and then go into the fancy twirls. You might not be able to hear me too well because I'm going far away. So I'm just kind of concentrating on doing them good. Was that helpful? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it was really cool. helpful to see your, your legs. I mean, the, and it could just be a, a misobservation on my part, but I got the dis distinct impression that a couple of those movements when you were changing orientation, your legs maintained, you know, uh, th that semicircular movement, you know, as if you were keeping that standing on state kind of leg structure mm -hmm. it, because you, your feet didn't come together. Your knees didn't come together. You kept that, the sphere, like you were sitting on the sphere, that sphere moved with you. Cool. Awesome. So let's go into a couple of fancy pants twirls. Um, one is going to be like, like the peacock spreads its fan one. And so from the front, it looks like this, right? So this again, oh, I forgot to talk about this. I got to talk about this first. So this is important, right? So this one, this is a really good one to get used to this twirl with the staff. You can do, you see this one, this is a good, this is um, not necessarily considered like a really strong performance twirl. It's actually considered basics because of this kink, right? But when you, but what's really great about it is you can step with it here, right? Here, open step. You can move with it like this, you know? But we, I use this troll not for staff so much, but for mostly long tasseled street sword. And so, you know, it, I, it got put in a staff. I've never, I've never really seen people, I think people default to it because it's an easy one to learn, but it's, but you watch the flow, watch. See how it stops and kinks rather than, rather than just letting it go. So there's a, and that's, this is cool to do, right? You can go back into that as a reverse, but this is what I would call a punctuation move within the flow. But what's important about what's important about this one, right, <laughs> is if I'm here, what's important to get this one is once you start learning this twirl, which goes over, and I'll demonstrate it from the back here, right? See, there's that position again. It's a carryover, right? But what people, I think, what I've noticed is that this position being punctuated, right? actually is a carryover so you can go right into it and face the opposite direction. Then it doesn't become a hiccup. What it does is it becomes here, it comes an extension up over there. And then you can go into the one that Holly's really famous for around the back here, and then go back into the one that I just demonstrated. So then you're starting to break, you have spheres here, you have spheres this way, and then you have spheres. So you have all these planes which you operate on. 
So that's that one. Is that helpful to understand the purpose, the purpose I use that for? And with long tasseled straight sword, most of the time you're going forward. And maybe that's something I could show you sometime later, but it becomes a forward one and then into that sweep again. So the, the impression I get from that one is that uh, it, it seems like both those positions that second, they have secondary values as, as parries or weapon beats. Yes, that's a great way to think about it. Weapon on the farm. So if you need to clear the line, You've got, you know, skeletal reinforcement. Oh, yeah, totally. This totally clears the line. And, and in, the, in, in one of the beginning, Pequa staff forms, that's like the first move. It's like you're here, and then you just, like, punch. Then you go in, and then, like, do you know what I mean? So definitely good for long arm stuff. And it also teaches you where and where not to put the stick, right? Because if I go here, I'm just going to hit myself in the butt. Yeah. If I'm here, I'm just going to – I can't I can't grab it. It's weird, right? So you find – that happy medium again it's not exactly halfway but it's not a third because a third will be, get off balance so it's this kind of golden mean feeling yeah. you're going to get and that comes you'll find that with everything you work with all right back to the what i'm just going to for sake of an easier term call like the peacock spreads its fan kind of spin right so if i'm looking at it from the back it's here this is a really important exercise to do basic wise here so you go here, out, here, out, both sides, right? Just to get ready for it going over your head. Here, out, here, out, right? So now here, as soon as this comes in here, I lift in between thumb and finger. Now don't keep this close here, but go here, throw it out then come behind to this area, extend out, pull in here. So again, you have, you can see it, Jeff, and comment when you see it, I'll do it stiffly and then I'll do it circle within circle, okay? But stiffly. Then you can see the glitch in the right. And then circle within a circle. So you can see it, you know what I mean? That's also, again, adds to the transition. And that becomes, I don't really do a lot of fancy footwork with that one because that's a pretty like, stay in one place, let me show you my staff skills kind of thing. And then the next one is the around the body. That comes right out of this one. So from the front, if this one's important that you stay narrow, but then you also take a step with it. You step with the opposite, you pull back here, and then you throw. So here, and this is where you see pictures like he's like, it's like, you're all, yeah, you know what I mean? But that's in the middle of that twirl where it comes down and it's just like boom, on the head here, this way. You can go right into that one again and they go, see how I go wide when I go for the peacock one, see, go wide. But then when I go just forward around the body, I think of like kind of making like, I don't know what, like a monkey staff retrieving man out of my spear, staff, whatever I'm moving around, you know, and that's a pretty static one that goes around. And I train that because that one's a really good spin for transitions. So like you can be here in your clock twirl, you're training. Then you go into this one here. Oh, okay, I'm warming up with that one. Okay, then I'm gonna go into this one here, do this one a couple times. Then I go into this one a couple times and look how my footwork changes here, I step together here. And then I go here and then I'm into that one that goes around my body you know, and then I can go into all the traditional stuff. So those around the body ones, again, one, they're really fun to do and really cool, especially for stage combat. They can clear a room if people don't know any better what they are, just by intimidation. And also they're really good for transitions. So those are the three philosophies I work with those. Yeah, that's, that's, that's everything you just said. I mean, they're, they're beautiful to look at. Certainly I can see its applicability to what we do because part of what we do obviously is visual presentation because we're obviously we're not going to actually defend ourselves with lightsabers so there's that yeah. value in presentation but i noticed it and i was looking for the strategy there and i'm wondering if this is part of the training doctrine is that when you did transitions you reinforce the weapon so yep. like so that because you can't see where it's going so mm -hmm. because you can't see where it's going you're making sure the weapon's braced so you can clear anything that comes into that box trying to invade your blind spot. Yeah, and that's a real personal thing of mine is I always have both hands on my weapon. 
You see a lot of people do staff work and they're doing it with one hand. Even with this one, man, you see a lot of people do this one with one hand. Now, that's great if you got a lightweight staff made out of PVC. You try to do that with my titanium one, you're going to rip your shoulder joint out. So there's a reason why I do it like that, because then I can reinforce it. Then I know I can, I can take it and I can stop. And I, you know what I'm saying? Because I have that skeletal reinforcement. That's super important to me. Even this one I do, even though that part's one-handed, this one I do with my titanium because it just builds an incredible dynamic strength when you're doing a heavier weapon this way. And it also gets your pot. You can't do this one with bad posture, right? If I try to do it with bad posture, like turtle back, like look at this. Right, I'm just, I'm just chopping my own butt off with the lightsaber right there. Right. So it's like, so it, it really teaches you, you know, it teaches yeah. you to keep open, but at the same time, power to, contra to, to engage, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so those are really good exercise ones, especially when you start getting stronger and you want to open your body up with and um, have a kind of lengthening power rather than just a short power with technique. Have a long power training with maybe a heavier. I'm not saying get a 15 pound weight bar or something. That's, I mean, maybe to maybe Juggernaut the Slayer can do that, yeah. but I ain't doing that no more. To each their own, man. You want to open your body up with and um, have a kind of lengthening power rather than just a short power with technique, have a long power training with maybe a heavier. Why, why come I just heard myself? That was weird. Yeah, that was oh, weird. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's the um, the monitor. Okay, cool. Um, Let me go over one more. Q &A from, uh, we got, we've got one question here on the uh, chat. All right, let's do it. Uh, and then I want to do the last, the last one that's spear oriented, but it's not one that's commonly used, but I want to show it. Oh, okay. Um, so this question from Charles Ratcliffe, can you explain the difference between Shaolin staff and monkey staff? Sure. Shaolin dudes are Buddhist and I'm a Taoist. <laughs> there you go. That's it. Not only that, it's like the difference between like Da Sheng Men. Men means gate. Shaolin Su, Su is temple or ashram, right? So it's a temple style. So that means all of those people are going to get standardized stuff. In my style, it was apprentice, apprentice. Yes, master to apprentice, master to apprentice. So, you know, Polly had like, what, six students? How many people are at the temple? So it's going to be a very different relationship with the weapon. It's not going to be standardized. The techniques are going to be similar. Also with monkey, there's a lot of... Um, you're invoking an animal spirit rather than just a technique with the weapon. So not only do you have to learn the technique with the weapon, then you have to transcend that technique by imbuing it with an individual sense of your relationship to, in my case, the Monkey King. My first step in that relationship was getting the titanium staff and that changed my technique because it was no longer a lightweight weapon. So this is a little in the weeds about following on that question, but, uh, and I never really thought about Chinese arts this way, but it makes perfect sense. So we, we, you, if I hearing you correctly, there's almost a tantric value to the weapon. Oh, it's, absolutely. For me, there is. It's when you I start. Don't, I don't let anyone touch that, that magic. That, that doesn't sound right. But you know, I, I don't let anyone, um, I don't, no one, I'll let anyone work techniques with whatever practice weapons I have. But that titanium staff's on my altar, like a, a, a katana or a daisho would be on um, the samurai's altar. And um, so it's, sorry, there's no plural in Japanese, samurai altar. And, um, so yeah, so you have to, there's a, if one thing I learned from Teacher Chi and from Polly and from Hu Jin Chang is if you don't respect the weapon, the weapon will not respect you. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's true. Any, any mm -hmm. period, any weapon. Yeah, <laughs> and I think that's a common thing. It's like, well, I can't remember who was it. It was one of the Western fencing masters that said I could not in my youth held a book and a sword at the same time, but now that I'm older, I can. He starts out his treatise like that. And it's like, that's so wise. It's like, there was a there was a knowledge and earned respect through practice. Yeah. To to not be flippant to the the com the answer between different styles is it's mostly when you're dealing with big styles that have temples surrounding them, it's always going to come back to standardized training. When you're dealing with master to apprentice, you're going to have a lot of individual variations because the training is going to be individual because one, you have the time for it. And two, the student teacher relationship is a very, very different dynamic. 
when I think about the Temple Styles, it's more like coach athlete than it is, you know? Yeah. That's it's how I think about it. For, for well, Sh- Shell Lynn is the, I mean, nowadays, I mean, there's, there's so many things that you can mean when you say Shell Lynn, right? Ever since uh, um, the Goshu Institute separated the, the martial arts with Wudong and Shell Lynn, which is a artificial. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, so there's it opens tons a big of stuff box. that's called Shaolin staff. That... Yeah, there, and it can open up a big can of worms. But I think, yeah, I think the main delineation, especially when people ask that question and they're beginning out, is they want to know the difference between. I see tons of people doing Shaolin, thousand people. There's like five people doing monkey staff. Like, why is that? There's monkey staff in Wushu or Shaolin Wushu. You know what I mean? So yeah. I think the difference is is the relationship with the art and relationship with the teacher. All right, let me go into that final twirl. So this one, you warm up here. I do this way. This is a very spear-like. I'm just doing it with a staff just because that's all I got right now. Here. But then there's a cast that happens here, right? The cast. Almost like, uh, it's like, you know, old man fisherman style here. Now, what's good about this one is you go forward here, rotate at the third, and then have a circle within the circle here. Now, this is really good when you have a weighted weapon, especially with a halberd at the long end, because you really get this centripetal force going. And that's really what it's designed for. But it's also a very, very cool one to do with this staff because it's unexpected and people have, don't really use it all that often. So for a performance quality, especially if you're like doing a twirl here and then like, oh my gosh, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to come here this way, extend out here, fake like a defense there. And then from there, I can go right in to my upper ones again, send it back into wherever I need to go. So working that, let me show you close up on the grip because it's complicated. Here, it's basically the same as a clock twirl. The only difference is, is that you're rotating the other way. So you're here, this pulls up here. Now, see, I'm really joined at the wrist, almost like, well, this is also a really good staff technique if you're handcuffed, I guess. I didn't think about that till now. You got zip tie on you, you got to use a staff. Here you go. So, you know, so you can see, like, I'm really, I'm really, um, I'm basically floating, like, you know, doing all these kind of palms just with the, with the stick here. And I'm really using just the circles and my grip to make the staff go around. And it teaches you a lot about flow. Jeff, what you were talking about, like spirals working outward in every direction. This is a really good advanced spin, even if it's just to get those principles and also to get the staff in a good relationship of away from your body and close to your body. So you're not too close and not too far. Cool. So that's all I got today. Anyone else have any questions? This was really great. This is great. I mean, my questions are kind of big picture, and I'll have What's to go. Cool. Back. I mean, maybe maybe we can have a follow up or something, Jeff. Maybe you and I could talk and do big picture picture questions when we have yeah, more time. Yeah, that, that was what I was going to suggest. So I don't, you know, uh, steal all the time from everybody else's questions for what you were teaching, but. My sense is there's an alchemical process to this. You're focusing on one animal here, but if we look at the idea of the Axis Monday, we look at the tantric value of inculcating these animals as you move through them, it seems like there's an alchemical process at the end of this after moving through the animals. Yeah, and also through the Taoist elements. I think, Jeff, why don't you and I set a time to do <laughs> yeah, an hour awesome. discussion just on the alchemical, you know, who, you know, all of us get together, you, me, Chad, everybody. Daniel would be great to have on that too. Like just, of of all the of certain processes that lead us to a deeper understanding of that chad and i have talked about it before you know mm-hmm. but but i think if i really love your questions because they spark a lot of interest so let's make sure that we communicate after this to set up a time to do that yeah absolutely and back to cool. the combat piece uh you mentioned it just now briefly but all through this it didn't seem like you talked about glaive work very much until now and when you were doing that, i go hey that looks like a halberd that looks like naginata work that he's doing and it seems like, is that just a thing? Because obviously a halberd is if you squish staff and spear together, you, you get halberd. And yeah, so I've if- never, I, I made a kind of a choice to concentrate on four weapons, like the monkey staff, spear, straight sword, both single and double handed and broadsword in all of its manifestations. I didn't, I mean, I can maybe pick up a chain whip and kind of fake it, sure. but I didn't want to become like a jack of all trades. I really wanted to know these four. So I really concentrated all my studies and everything around them tertiary, like looking at like a one-handed gen and its relationship to small sword. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, so making it depth rather than just um, form on top. 
you know so my so i i do that but yes it's like but yeah you could use your kwandao naginao anything that has a blade like that at the end totally yeah. do all that stuff with yeah it's one thing the universal nature of the, of the staff yeah one thing you gotta be uh like with a guandao you have to be you, you have to be a little bit careful with that because it does not handle like a staff oh yeah dude those things are unruly as hell yeah and they're not really a long-range weapon they're a cavalry weapon but like you're holding it really close to the blade most of the time and if you went out any further whoo hoy i mean that's a that's yeah, a that's heavy, heavy weapon. but um, when i one, worked with the spear the thing that i've done a lot with that one is like um i like to really the little snakehead spear Mm -hmm. i just like that yeah. one a lot and um and then also like that there's in the opera there was a character that I learned where he um, rode a horse in the battle, but he died on a horse carriage. I forget the name of it off the top of my head, but he had like a monk's looking spade, but it was smaller so he could wield it like that. It wasn't like one of those crazy, girthy, ridiculous ones. Yeah, right, right. But the one thing that you get that, that I think that people should sh should realize here at, um, to, to kind of talk to Jeff's comment is that in Chinese martial arts, the staff is used as training for almost everything. Um, if you're going to train Sanda, right, um, it, um, and I've seen this happen, I don't know how many times, um, a traditional guy would usually throw a stick at the guy and say, okay, learn this, learn this step for him. It's like, but I just want to, want to fight, you know, learn the stick. I form. mean, he's right, because it's like, if you think about all the things, you know, like you think about like learning stuff like this, right, and then it becomes like a throw. Over. Like there's all these kind of things you can like learn. Like when you look at old old grappling things, like with Shui Chao, they're always using a grip stick or. A... And well, I that think was the, the other thing just... I was going to mention was that it's it's um, stick forms in barehanded styles are very often not as useful as stick forms as they are catalogs of uh china or joint locking and stuff like that because what is that thing chad the tai chi ruler right yeah because yeah. like when you have sticks like that what it does is it it teaches you that space between a space right in a kinesthetic yeah. way and i think it's a good learning tool and that's the whole thing if you think about the body as being like like small staffs in one place or the other and you think about manipulating those staffs both in your own body and in your opponent's so the stick, I mean, it's called the grandfather of all weapons for, you know, a reason. It's obviously the first weapon that we probably ever picked up was just a stick, you know. Oh, beat it. You know, you know, maybe a rock, but a stick is longer. So it's like, hey, that's that's better. I can keep them away from me better. But yeah, so it's it's it, it, it will train. I mean, obviously, everything, everything, almost all of our tools are based on a stick in some in some fashion so are there any other questions from the chat or you guys before we hang uh, it up yes Roberto. uh we've got a... uh we don't have any questions as such some, right, some cool. well if he, as i said before if people watch and have questions later yeah roberto what's yours yeah, the the, uh, the only thing I was I, I wanted to go back to that to that discussion that we were that we were uh, start we started and touched just a little bit on, on the tantric value of the weapon itself. Okay, and, cool. Uh, how uh, yes, you, you you will have loner weapons that you give to students and uh, lo uh, and loner weapons that are uh, that are for everybody to, to train on, but that your titanium uh, staff is your titanium staff, and you have a special relationship with that with that one and you get different insights from that weapon that you would get from basically a, a school a school staff or yeah, a yeah. school saver, a loner, loner saver. And uh, I, uh, I think that's a much deeper conversation for maybe a follow on one of these chats, but how do we uh, start applying some of those principles to the lightsaber when oh, a lot yeah. of times uh, it's considered a toy? And a lot of times, a lot of your loner devices for the students are going to be toys at one point, and then they tr they turn into training devices. And uh, how do you start developing that sense of this is a weapon or this is a training device, and it will be treated as such, and therefore it will give you some insights, and you'll have a relationship to, with it that even though at some points you will be training with a 
Hasbro Disney thing that you got from the toy section at the at the at the uh, Walmart or something like that. But you can put yourself in a mental frame of mind that while I'm training with this thing, it's no longer a toy. This is my training device, and I will respect it as such. And that will give you a different insight into how to use it than if I'm just flogging around a a toy for that matter. And and how how do we start developing that kind of uh, that kind of mentality and that kind of philosophy on a uh, on a on a school curriculum? Well, I think of- everyone needs to go watch Conan the Barbarian and learn <laughs> about the Riddle of Steel. I think that's a good first start, you know, and, um, and you know, all humor aside, but there's a lot of truth to that. And it's like, you know, when I pick up and, and ultimately the titanium thing, I don't want to give to my students because it's basically a safety issue. Cause if you make a mistake with that, you're really going to feel it. And also it's heavy, it's weighted and you have to be, it's not that I haven't had any of my students work with it. Like, like my student, Zach Roberts, you know, he got so skilled. I mean, when I first got, when I first got made by my student, Michael, it was at the school, we were all the more advanced students were working with it, but it's, but it didn't, but it becomes a very personal meditation. When I was working with the, with the NY Jedi, I, I was poor. I didn't even have a lightsaber half the time I was teaching them class. I was borrowing whoever's until their payment for me with lessons was to get me one of those lightsabers made by um Bob, the old license, you know, and now I have this like, man, it, it looks like it came from Tython compared to all the things now, <laughs> super old school, but that, but then that became mine because it mm-hmm. was a gift. And so I think it's um, stunt saber, personal saber, the same, you're not the same. However, when you get that special thing where you view it with yours, you'll, you'll arrive at it naturally. And I think doing it when, when the more you're going to go through a lot, changing sabers finding different things you're going to find something that's essentially personal however the more you go through different things and wielding it and working it once you get to that personal one you can always pick up whatever and use it does that make sense it's a difficult question and i think jeff when we do our things let's address this one in, in greater detail for multiple yeah, I, was, I was just going to say that it's a that is a, a a deep question that can be answered both exoterically and esoterically also from an artist and as a, a combatant trainer all four of those quadrants can speak to that question. So it's a great question to, to, to reference. I mean, my, myself personally, I don't have kids. I have no toys. I have actual weapons and I have training aids. Both receive the same amount of respect. Yep. Uh, Even my know. foam noodle. None right. of the kids pick up the foam noodle. <laughs> the foam noodle is for the coach. For me, the teacher, it's, it's not their foam noodle. Don't touch my foam noodle. Don't, they'll pick it up. And I'm like, no. <laughs> no pool noodle for you so when they finally learn and they go to a school they're going to know that like that's important even though right now is this floppy phone noodle. but it's but it's it's here man you know what i'm saying yeah and that's the beauty of it that there's a way to work it internally but there's also uh an exploration of how to codify that into how do you intentionally instill that into those you come in contact with while you're uh, while you're savoring and teaching Mm-hmm. I think I think it's something to ask on. What? How are we at with time, you guys? So we are just about at the end of the hour here. All right, cool. That's perfect. Yep. I can say I can say one thing that, um, especially with weapons like uh, Sanjigun, the three section staff, and oh god, rope darts and soft weapons like that. Um, there are weapons are teachers, and some teachers are far more far more strict than others yeah man the um, rope guard i think is probably a very cruel teacher oh it's a oh it, it is it is definitely a very cruel teacher <laughs> but you learn quickly um and and the you know and it's funny the because, like, the i know the staff's weapons. the grandfather of weapons is that the drill sergeant of weapons yeah oh god i no that's like the i don't know that's like the the the, the crazy drunk uncle of weapons <laughs> <laughs> nice um, yeah it's you know, anytime you, you hand somebody a three section staff that doesn't has never used it before they instantly start getting afraid because they see these two things swinging there with every little movement and they're like oh <laughs> you yeah. Know? so yeah i mean they can be intimidating anyway okay so uh one little quick 
check. All right. Okay. So we're all good. Cool. So I guess that is uh, we that is the end of the class today. So we will uh, take our leave today. Thank you, Damon, for for the class. Uh, thank you, Jeff, My pleasure. for coming in and participating. Thanks to all of you for watching at home. Um, we will be here uh, soon, so stay tuned for for the for our New Year's uh, offerings, which are going to be very varied and different, and coming at a greater pace and all of that. But that's news for an, for another day. Um, we will see you later. Patience, practice, perseverance. Happy sabering. Happy sabering. Okay.